Welcome to Mrs. V Shift Stories, and I'm very honoured tonight to have the inspiring David Cook with us. Welcome. <laughs> He's uh, Chairman and Managing Director of Conica Minolta, and I was just inspired by the many things that you do in your life and how you help women of the world, so thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Yeah, so we're going to hear more, mm -hmm. and I'm excited, so there we are, Mrs. V Shift Stories. And our first question is, what is your story? Well, I suppose I could um, uh, reinterpret that as, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and yes, I am the Chairman and Managing Director of Conica Minolta, but I don't think that's necessarily what defines me, even though I spend a lot of my life doing that. Um, I probably see myself first and foremost as a dad. Mm. Uh, my kids are both adults, they've grown up and they left home, but. Um, um, I'm still very closely connected to them and they, they are the greatest source of nourishment and joy for me in my life. Beautiful. Um, and I suppose in terms of uh, just me as an individual, um, I'm just somebody that's going through life uh, who believes that life's about learning and um, I've made plenty of mistakes in my life and I'll probably make plenty more but um, it's about growth for me and, um, and just trying to be a a good, decent human being and where possible make a little bit of a difference to perhaps some others who are less fortunate than myself. And you actually taught transcendental meditation, which I think is incredible for someone who is in the corporate world so much and having to kind of that difference. Do you find that that is an issue for you? Or? Well, I, I think to have multiple aspects to your life really is a plus, it's a, it's a benefit. Uh, and you're right, when I was 17 and just left school, I uh, learnt the technique of TM, Transcendental Meditation. Um, it was quite life-changing for me, and at age 19 I became a teacher of TM and taught for quite a few years full-time. Uh, and um, but then found myself in the corporate world, which is where I still am today. But I didn't leave the, um, uh, the world of meditating and, and more of an, of, uh, an inner journey behind. I simply did my best to incorporate the two. See, I love that, and I think that is so important because people think it's almost not to be extreme, but somehow find the balance and if you can mm. make a difference. Because we all have to work, we all have to live in the one world, it is operating, and then how can you kind of help inside that space? Yeah, and I think sometimes when people do pursue possibly an Eastern philosophy or, or technique or program, they can sometimes feel that um, to attain the heights I really want to, I have to be an ascetic, I have to withdraw, I, I have to be a monk or live in a cave or whatever. Um, but I think if, if you're born in the West, then I think your path is probably different to somebody that's born uh, in the East, um, you know, with, with a more sort of inward path ahead of you. And, uh, and I, I think the, the, the trick for me, the, the real life lesson for me, which continues to be a lesson is incorporating the two and having each of them nourish each other. Beautiful. Yes, the lifelong journey. Mm, yes. <laughs> Love it. Uh, okay, so the next question is, what is your best advice? Oh, best advice. Well, um, the best advice I've ever been given, um, continuing on the theme we've just been discussing, which may or may not be relevant to anybody else, but it certainly was quite defining for me, um, was when I left a, um, a job that I'd been in for a long, long while um, and uh, before I looked for anything else, I headed off to India, uh, as one does. <laughs> and um, uh, the fall. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> and, spend, and I'd spent a bit of time there with a teacher previously and I went back uh, and I said to him that I had just left this role and I was working out what to do next and any advice he could give me would be greatly appreciated. And he asked me what options I was weighing up. And I said, well, one of them is perhaps to stay in India. I could do a lot more meditation and more yoga practice. And I just started a, um, a PhD and I could focus full time on that and so on. I said, another alternative is my kids live in Byron Bay. I thought I could, I could go and live in Byron and be closer to them and, and do my research uh, up there. Yeah. Uh, and then as a throwaway line, I said, or I suppose I could just stay in Sydney and stay in the corporate grind. Uh, and he said, yes, yes, that's the, that's the best option for you. Go back to Sydney and stay in the grind. <laughs> and he said, because that is actually where you, for your, you as an individual, um, that is your path. And that's where you will um, you'll grow and find that you'll find the most spirituality 
with that lifestyle other than the, the two alternatives you've just given me. It's not amazing. It is like that story of, um, the, what film it was, that a monk meditating in the most busy, noisiest place. It's like the best practice, really, isn't it? Yes, yeah. There's some uh, old expression, I think, which is you can become enlightened uh, from the exhaust fumes of a passing bus in New York or London. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so it doesn't matter where you are, no excuses, eh? I love that, I love that. Okay, so our next question is, very apt, what is spirituality to you? Oh. Spirituality for me would be the pursuit of wholeness through a search for the spirit, a search for the soul, um, a, a journey to find out who you are and why you're here. So it has more of an inner connotation for me rather than an external pursuit of materiality. But I think it's, it's an inward journey to bring the, the power of the inner aspects of life out to both benefit you in your outer life and also hopefully to benefit others. And there's, there's an expression in Vedic culture, ancient Indian culture, or a word called Dharma, which is Dharma is your path and life is deemed to be about finding that path and then remaining on that path and that'll be your fastest highway uh, to, of, of evolution. And, um, and whenever we hit crossroads or, or little zigzags or uh, whatever, roadblocks, um, the, 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 the idea is that you just continue the pursuit of your Dharma and you don't go off that Dharma and that's how you will have a most rewarding life and a most enriched life. Such a big question, isn't it? Because I know a lot of people, and because I do branding of people and taking them on their journey, is what is my dharma? You know, what is my path? Yeah. And I guess that's part of the journey is finding out what that is and learning to listen to signs. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, when things when things go well, uh, then you're probably on your dharma or, or uh, close to your dharma. When think you know when you're suffering and life's full of heartache and pain and things aren't going well and so on then you probably have to question am I really on the right path at this point it's funny isn't it because sometimes I know that when I went on my decided my path everything fell apart and yeah there perhaps is a correction period do absolutely you think? <laughs> I completely agree so in, in the first instance yeah. and sometimes um, Sometimes nature or the universe or God or whatever expression you choose to use as an individual has to come along and give you a bump over to the other path because you just don't get it yourself. Yeah. And that bump, when you get thrown off your current road, which might be out of your current marriage or relationship, out of your current job, you might lose all your money, whatever it might be, that bump can be a correction just to put you back on a path which ultimately despite the short-term setback, will just cause you to zoom along and be infinitely more, more happy than you ever were before. But we, we, we create attachments. So when, when, yes. when, we, uh, when life propels us onto a different path, we feel angst and pain at letting go of the previous path. Yeah. But sometimes you just have to trust. And, and just, just, just observe yourself after a after some pain <laughs> yes. for a short period of time and just see if, if in fact that hasn't been a good thing, a good correction. Yeah, yeah. No, very, very good advice because I know it happens to quite a few of us. <laughs> um, question number five is, how did you find success? Well, I think the question presupposes that I've found yes. success. Uh, I know, I knew that. <laughs> and I don't think I have. Right, it's interesting. And I, I, don't okay. want to, uh, I don't want to sort of overdo the journey word. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, that's true. But, you know, I think we're all very much on a journey. And you could define success as well. I've got a million dollars or $10 million, or, mm. um, which I don't, by the way. But <laughs> what is it? And um, that's the thing is it's all about what is success for you and really... You know, if it's, you know, sorry, just to digress, but there was a couple of guys who came out recently about talking about minute being minimalists. Yes, they were yes. On the project, I, and they talk about. I saw their comment. documentary. And they got what they thought was success, and they still weren't happy. And I think yeah. that was really a great mm. way of looking at. Well, you have to think about what that is for you. You know, 
because often people then get what they want and they're not. Jim Carrey, for example, talks about a lot. Yes, yeah, and but also I think, in a funny kind of way, um, to to have some dissatisfaction, possibly as a spur to to move on, to reach for more, to to not be complacent. Um, yeah. You know, in, in a funny kind of way, sometimes maybe comfort cannot be our best friend. It is what my best advice was getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yes. And yes. Um, that has certainly led me through to kind of going, because I always remember as a parent, you know, as soon as everything was comfortable and I had a routine, you know, when he was young, it had changed like that, like clockwork. And that was the thing is that's just what was it's going to be like that always in life. Yes, you know? yes. Fantastic advice. And then um, teach me something that I don't know. Oh, um, so... Um, it would. F it feels a little bit arrogant of yeah. me to think that I know something you don't know. No, but you do. I'm <laughs> um, sure um, you taught me a couple of things already. With well, <laughs> I wanted you to share. Which I um, so, well, I'll, I'll get a little bit serious at the yes. moment. Um, uh, of late, I have um, intentionally researched and studied a great deal about a topic called modern slavery, which is the fact that slavery still exists today. And, um, and the reason I'm mentioning it is that it's not top of mind for a lot of people. I mean, why would it be? You don't think but about it. You don't, no. And to my eternal shame, up until about five years ago, I thought sh uh, slavery had been eliminated in the Civil War or an act of parliament in London in 1865 or whatever. Um, but it's far from the truth. There are more people enslaved today than at any point in hu human history. And many of them are women and children. Um, so they're mining rare earth minerals. These are the little kids in mines in Africa that go into our smartphones. Um, the women are making our cheap clothes in factories in Bangladesh. Um, there are men enslaved on Thai fishing boats off the coast of Thailand where they've been trafficked, kidnapped, uh, put on a boat. And of course, they have no uh, way of escaping. In fact, authorities have found people who've been on those boats for up to 30 years. Um, no, oh. no payment, not seeing their families, their families assume they've died, um, and, um, and you know, brutal, violent conditions. And then that su seafood finds its way onto our plates. So I, I suppose something I've started to do is I start to ask the questions, who made my clothes? And I've actually got apps on my phone, a couple of apps called, uh, one's called Shop Ethical and one's called Good On You. And before I buy an article of clothing, I try and remember, I'm not perfect at this, but I try and remember to pull my phone out, have a look at the app, and just see how that particular organisation is rated in terms of human rights abuses or environmental uh, responsibility and things of that nature. Um, Amazing. And, and there's, there's research suggests there's about 46 million people in slavery today. See, that is extraordinary. When I heard that number from me, because I didn't know the full data time, it was incredible. Yeah, and regrettably, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of women and children. Um, yeah. um, I go to Cambodia regularly. I've, I've held a 13-month-old baby who had been raped. Um, I've met three-year-olds who have been rescued from brothels, which is sexual slavery. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty tough stuff. So what can someone do about it? Like, I mean, we'll put a link in this, in this post as well. What can someone do to help, apart from being aware? Yeah, one, yeah. Being informed? Yeah, and I think that's, that's very important. I don't yeah. underestimate that. Um, Maybe the app too would be great. Yeah, so the people can start make better decisions. Yeah, the apps um, yeah. in terms of shopping. Yeah. Um, Having a chat to the, the people who run the company you work for and ask them if they're um, aware of the fact that there are problems in most company supply chains where things are made. Um, and, and there are also some very good not-for-profit organisations in Australia working against slavery. Um, there's the Freedom Partnership, which is um, the Salvation Army. There's Anti-Slavery Australia. Uh, for some years I was on the board of one called Project Futures who fundraise to support anti-slavery work both here and in Cambodia. Um, so you can just have your antenna up and uh, I think once you've heard the word slavery in this context, then you kind of tend to hear about it a bit more. Well, it's funny because I did a workshop at the Freedom Hub. And oh, yes. And when I went in there, I went, oh, this is beautiful. And then I saw these women on the wall and I saw it was an org. And I was like, what's this about? And she said it was about slavery. And I was like, 
I didn't know this happened. And then I met you and I was like, gosh, suddenly it's showing yes. up, the word. So yeah. it's great just to become conscious of it. Yeah, them. and I should have mentioned the Freedom Hub. It's a great yeah, cafe it's and they do cafe. fantastic work. She yeah. does amazing work in there. Yeah. But it will pop up for me. <laughs> and our last question is, what is the biggest shift that you've had in your life? Oh. Sure, there's a few. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I think it probably is five years ago I met a woman in... Cambodia called Somali Man who herself had been trafficked as a teenager and now spent over 20 years rescuing young girls from brothels. She'd rescued about 7,000. Um, and um, uh, I'm now on her global board. And I think, I think certainly uh, in the last five years, the most defining shift for me was just realizing how incredibly fortunate and lucky I am. And my daughters are, and everybody I know is really in this country. Um, although we have some slavery here. But if you can just imagine, you know, think about your life today. Think about the biggest problem or the thing that's causing you to lie awake at night today and then picture yourself as a slave yeah. in a brothel, on a Thai fishing boat, in a mine, in some sort of forced labour and yeah. compare the two. Um, so that really, that shook me to my core mm. to think that 46 million people are experiencing that currently. And that really made me sit up, take notice, and want to, want to do something. Yeah, oh, incredible numbers, amazing. As you said, you just, I thought it was, didn't exist. Mm. Quite, kind of shocking. An amazing shift for you in your own life. Imagine just having that w awake thing and then being able to appreciate where you are so much more in your own life. Yeah. And, and then it makes it understandable where you are now and what you're doing in the corporate world. Another corporate warriors. <laughs> yeah, and, and the good thing about being the managing director and the chair of a company is that um, we can direct some funding, some resources, some time, some influence um, on helping to eliminate slavery. So uh, we've been very active in um, speaking to parliamentarians in Canberra about something called a Modern Slavery Act that would compel mm -hmm. all businesses in Australia above a certain revenue threshold. Um, to investigate their supply chains. Go and shine a light, have a look, and see how the goods and services that they, uh, that they sell and also the things that they simply consume yeah. um, you know, are, are in fact made. And that legislation, if it gets up this year in Parliament, um, will cause there to be significant discussions about modern slavery in the boardrooms of Australia, which will be a good thing. Amazing, thank you. Very inspiring, is it inspiring? And, and this is what I wanted to do in this series too, is just really showcase people doing great work in the world and you certainly are doing it. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> All right, so stay tuned. We'll be back next week uh, with our next guest, Andrew Sloan, and he's going to talk all about what work he's doing in the corporate world to help um, you know, corporate lifestyle and culture be a better place. And um, have a great night and we'll see you soon. Bye.